Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Karen Schunk, and I'm the Director of Operations for the Energy Management Association. Thank you for joining us for the latest installment in the EMA webinar series. We run these the first Tuesday of every month, and I would like to thank Honeywell for sponsoring this month's webinar. I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items before we get started. First of all, the presenter will wait until the end of the presentation to answer your questions. But we do encourage you to submit them at any time using the Q&A button that you see at the bottom of your screen. If you happen to be experiencing technical problems during the webinar, please use the chat function to inform panelists and our technical ex experts will assist you. The presentation is being recorded and will be available for viewing in about a week. And for those of you who need continuing education credit, everyone in attendance for the full webinar will receive a certificate of attendance sent to their email within 24 hours. So, today's webinar is Take Full Control of Your Building's Wasted Plug-in Energy Use with Siddhartha Chatterjee, who is General Manager, Connected Power BMS with Honeywell Building Technologies. Sid is responsible for driving Honeywell BMS Business's new BTI for connected power globally. Prior to taking on this role, Sid was part of the HCE Connected Buildings, leading the Forge and EBI for Buildings as a general manager. He's been in roles of sales leadership, customer marketing, and pre-sales across HCE and HBT in India and the US over his tenure at Honeywell. Thank you again for joining us. And with that, I'll hand it off to our expert, Sid to kick us off. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. I hope I'm audible and my screen is visible. Uh, so thank you again, team, and, and the whole EMA organization uh, for the opportunity to be part of this webinar and allowing me to talk about our uh, latest offering, which as you can understand from the theme of the webinar is around plug load management. Uh, I will obviously go into deeper, much deeper into the offering, but before I go any further deeper, let me start off with the agenda for today. Uh, the webinar is structured around uh, some key learning objectives as it is a learning seminar. We will we will start off by talking about what a building energy building energy and management system is, what are its benefits, how we architect. From there, we will go on to this uh, new and interesting technology that Honeywell is bringing to the market, uh, specifically around plug load management and how it gets integrated part of the BMS system. Uh, we will maybe go a little bit deeper into the technology. Uh, finally, talk about some of the places where we have already installed, including some of the customer testimonials that we will cover. And then finally, we will go into the future of BMS as where we are heading as an organization and Honeywell being a key leader in this particular space. We will finally kind of end with a Q&A session, uh, as Karen mentioned. Uh, for all the participants of the webinar, just to remind you once more, you can sub keep on submitting your questions questions throughout the webinar. However, we will address all of those questions together at the end of the webinar, just so that we can accommodate everyone at the time that we have for the webinar. With that, let me just kick off into the webinar for today with the learning objectives. One, as I mentioned, we'll cover the building and energy management system, including the energy and decarbonization story of why it is having a building and energy management system inside a building is relevant in today's time. Uh, we will talk about what the EMS does, and we will delve into deeper as the new technology that we are bringing, which now allows a BEMS system to start managing your plug loads. Uh, we will introduce the plug load, talk about the clear business case of why we need to integrate plug loads as part of our BMS systems, and then discuss a little bit deeper into the capabilities and the features and the offerings that they have. And then finally, how the regulation and, and the scenarios are changing around plug load management, including talk about Title 24, which has already been implemented in states like California and Arizona, and why it is relevant for us to know and meet those compliance statutes that the states are releasing. Uh, with that, let me go into what is a BEMS system. 
I think this is uh, to most of the participants that might be known, but I want to stress that this is basically the brain of a building. Any, any smart building that you see is being controlled and managed by a BEMS system in order to provide a safe, energy efficient, and a controlled environment for all its occupants. Uh, the typical components of a BEMS system are a supervisor interface or a human machine interface. Generally, this is uh, either a browser-based or an application-based interface. Uh, the, the interface sits either on a server uh, in, in most scenarios, or it could be hosted on a cloud in today's times. Uh, the, the interface gets connected over a BEMS network using the controllers. Honeywell has been a leader in this space, and we have an exhaustive range of both controllers that have been used over the years in order to connect the BMS system. And then finally, on the edge, we have the field devices, uh, which range from various different kinds of sensors to actuators to end devices that we see. A combination of these four elements is what forms a BMS system. Uh, going further, the primary objectives that we are looking for from a BEMS system are, in essence, from a, a point of view of providing labor efficiency that comes with automating all of the processes of managing a building. Energy reduction and decarbonization is a clear outcome of implementing a BEMS system, including the, the, the improved experience of, of occupants inside the buildings. And obviously, in certain cases, legislation and compliance also drive the need of BMS systems to be installed in buildings. Let me go a little bit deeper as how a today's modern BMS system sits. If I start from the bottom, you see all of the edge devices that I was talking about, from the sensors to the valves, the actuators to uh, lighting controls. Today, we have EVA chargers and renewables and CCTV and fire alarm systems. And this range is pretty much bigger than what we have even been able to cover. There are access control systems. Any any, any, and any number of edge devices that you see inside a building, interactable, either interactable by an occupant or an operator, uh, are all of them are within the family of edge devices that we see. The next layer is all of the controllers. Uh, it ranges from plant controllers, where uh, they ranges from IO modules to integration gateways to room controllers, and even a thermostat falls within the family of controllers and room automation. Uh, then comes the communication layer. How do these controllers communicate among themselves or in the upper layer as well? So there is obviously BACnet, we have heard, that's one of the most standard protocols that are there in this particular industry. Uh, the ashtray uh, body basically manages that and we have few others that they are present and then comes the application and the presentation layer where we we do the data aggregation using the protocol like backnet from the pan controllers the data aggregation happens uh, then there are pre-built dashboards there are offerings there are bms supervisors that come in into this place you must have heard of the niagara uh, offerings and then other BMS applications that come in into this space. And then there is a new layer that is coming on top of it, which is where now our, including Honeywell, we are providing these cloud apps and services. So, so SaaS-based predictive maintenance applications, SaaS-based remote management applications, or even a billing and reporting, which basically extract data out of the supervisors and then provide additional incremental value to our customers. So this, in essence, is an end-to-end -end journey of a modern BMS system. Now let me come to the, the kind of the, the why scenario, and then slowly that leads into the, the plug load management scenario. So this is a typical breakup of a, a traditional commercial building that you see. Uh, think of a very traditional hospital, a school, or an office space. Uh, uh, on a hundred thousand square feet, very standard BMS managed uh, and and cooled from a central plant kind of a scenario. Uh, in most cases, typically the edge vac would be consuming almost fifty one percent of the energy. There may be a little bit ups and downs in this, 
but but on an average this is what we would end up consuming the, the whole cooling and the ventilation systems uh, uh, lighting would be a good major piece of it almost consuming 13 percent we have few other pieces but what we would end up seeing is uh, plug loads kind of taking up a chunk of, of almost approximately 25 percent and this is where comes uh, the interesting piece of the theme of today's presentation uh, today or or 99% of the world's BMS systems that you have today are primarily managing that 51%. And then some of them are also managing the 13%. Uh, however, almost none of the BMS systems are managing the 25% of the plug load energy, which is in fact, be, in spite of being a significant chunk of the energy consumption in a particular building, is left unmanaged. And today's webinar and the technology that we are trying to introduce to you as a group is where we are talking about that. How do we bring management control and eventually savings into that 25% bucket? Uh, the way we want to do it is bringing in connected power. So this in front of you is our connected power solution uh, that we are bringing into the North America market uh, very, very shortly. Uh, as you can see, Honeywell, and this is where the interesting piece comes, Honeywell has been a manufacturer for not only the BEMS system, but also a manufacturer for smart connected all sockets. So these all come from Honeywell end to end. Uh, uh, they come from the MK side of our house. MK, if, you, uh, if some of you know, has been a world leader, even though the North America presence has been uh, almost uh, low. They have been a major player in the European and the Middle East market and have been producers and manufacturers of um, wiring electrical wiring devices, including sockets and everything. Uh, so the, the base technology comes from MK, being a pioneer in the space of creating uh, the connected uh, the, the sockets, bringing in that technology and making it smart and connected and making it part of the BMS system. The way the technology works is all of these sockets now are being able to communicate with each other wirelessly. And, and finally, they all converge into a hub, which basically manages up to 50 outlets. The hub converts the complete data into BACnet over IP, which is being fed into a BMS system from which the BMS supervisor interface allows us to control, monitor, and display the information of all the sockets and the plugs that are now part of it. So what are the benefits that now we get and the capabilities that uh, these, these come in? So first of all, from the BMS system, you can now control the plug loads, all of it. Uh, when I say control, that means control the times they are being on, control how long they can be used, control how, what is the power level that could be, used from a particular socket and, and all of it that you can think of. Uh, yeah, what also happens as an outcome of providing that control, each of the sockets automatically become an energy meter in itself. So you can track the energy consumption of a particular receptacle continually over periods of time. You can slice and dice that data either a daily, monthly, weekly. You can start seeing trends and all of it. Uh, you can also start creating alert levels. So a lot of interesting use cases that we are seeing when, when we have launched this initially in the UK market is a lot of people not only want the energy management or the energy monitoring at a socket level, but they also want alert levels to be set for some critical assets, let's say, which are connected. Think of a hospital where we have plug connected ventilator machines or any other life safety machine. If anybody unplugs the machine by mistake, and it could be a life-threatening scenario, uh, we need to set alerts onto that, that if anything, any or even equipment goes down, which is plug connected, or if somebody pulls out the plug, uh, the alerts can be automatically sent. And moment you think of a BMS system, you can have any sort of workflow. There could be emails generated, there could be SMSs sent, there could be pop-ups that could be happening. So all kind of configurable alerts and associated workflows could be created. Uh, the interesting piece that I want to stress here, even though 
uh, you might have seen uh, a smart plug kind of a solution existing in the residential space. The thing that I want to clarify this, this solution has been built for a commercial scale. Uh, uh, a single system can support up to 5,000 receptacles and hence automatically comes the need of grouping them. If you are doing a deployment of something like this across large campuses, you need to create logical groups so that you can provide your, your scheduling based on the group and everything. Think of all the coffee machines that are there across a very large campus, maybe hundreds. What you want to schedule that after 8 p.m. when everybody has left, automatically shut down all coffee machines. And that's where comes the savings that you can. So the grouping capability allows us this kind of smart scheduling to be followed and given on them. Uh, finally, the interesting piece is the, the whole user display. Uh, the, this is a configurable user display, but the, the basic by default, the offering that comes from is the ability to manage, monitor each of the plugs, create trending, and then have downloadable reports uh, that you can download as based on the measurement and everything that you're looking for. Uh, the final and the most interesting piece of it is the temperature monitoring. Uh, the the each of the sockets come with the ability with a pre-built temperature sensor. Uh, you can configure the temperature alert capability within the system itself. The way it works by default is in case of any overheating scenario, uh, the, 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 the outlets are switched off automatically. That's one. And then second, you can configure appropriate alarms and alerts that you need to give out in case of such a situation happening. A thing to note is uh, a lot of fires uh, originate actually from socket overheating scenarios. In fact, uh, we had a, a report that last year, almost 12,000 fires in UK originated uh, from a socket overheating. Uh, so this is a significant safety issue uh, that we have seen all across and has been a concern for a lot of facility manager having this capability of automatically switch off in case of overheating as well as creating and generating alerts when the, as then when the temperature is rising is an exceptional value offering to have it in the sockets. Uh, so in essence, these are all the capabilities. I'm pretty sure there will be some people who are having questions and I'm happy to deep dive on the capabilities a little later in the Q&A section. Uh, now let me come back to the uh, interesting piece of the case study that we had uh, with, with one of our customers. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we had the opportunity to deploy this and uh, to launch this in UK market last year. We are bringing the offering into the uh, North America market very, very shortly uh, in the next year, in the first part of the next year. Uh, the, we implemented this in Cranefield University. Uh, uh, you see the gentleman whose photo we have provided is Gareth Ellis. He's the energy and the environment manager for Cranefield University. Uh, what we saw with Cranefield University, they deployed around 90 to 100 uh, of these new connected sockets. Uh, the interesting piece is that, that each of these sockets are retrofitable. So uh, they are supported by the same two wires that come into any regular socket. Uh, there is no change per se uh, with the way the electrical wiring has been made. Hence, there is uh, transitioning from a regular socket to a smart commercial grade socket is, is, is just taking that out from the wall, uh, putting the new one in its place, and that's done. So it's, a, it's, it's less than a minute's worth of activity of transitioning it from a regular socket into a smart socket. Then comes the part of commissioning and con uh, converting that is that's how that's being done through an app where you basically go to individual sockets, scan it and get it uploaded. Once the database is done uh, within the app of the sockets and they're individually mapped to all of the hubs, uh, the next part is almost smooth of getting it into a BMS system through our auto onboarding tools uh, and and for, so for a for a for a retrofitting a hundred socket system in a university like Grand Canfield was even a less than a day's worth of job there. Uh, so what we did is what the team did is one uh, uh, 
they had a very clear objective uh, of uh, and and this was part of their sustainability goals that the university had set one was to uh, measure their their plug load uh, consumption and then second create strategies around bringing it down so there was a very clear objectives that which uh, the Cranfield University started out with. Um, uh, the, in fact, Cranfield University is a world leading uh, university for innovation projects, uh, focused a lot around uh, aerospace uh, technology development. Uh, so once they selected 90 sockets, which were spread out throughout the university, they chose a good mix of classrooms, of uh, canteen areas, uh, common areas, and, and some of the labs that they chose. Uh, uh, the first part of the, the, the study that we did is they, they implemented this and, and ran it for two weeks. Uh, the first two weeks were actually used to create a baseline, as you see, uh, of, the, uh, of the usage. Uh, there was a very clear usage pattern that was coming up. Uh, there were certain periods of spike for usages, and then there were certain things which were kept running even if nobody was using. Uh, the common culprits uh, remained like vendor machines in, in canteens or coffee machines in the cafeteria or lab equipments, post lab closure times and everything. Uh, we worked with Gareth's team, and hence in the next two weeks, we basically started implementing the scheduling. Uh, when I say scheduling, this was basically switch off all coffee machines after the cafeteria is closed and switch it on maybe 30 minutes before the cafeteria comes on. For labs, similar scenarios. So different kind of scheduling based on the type of the assets, the type of the asset categories were implemented. Uh, once the schedule was implemented, we reran the baseline post that. We reran the baseline. Uh, the, what we found out was a very, very interesting scenario. Across the 90 sockets that we implemented, we achieved almost 60% savings in plug load uh, that, we, that we found out. Um, so a very interesting use case. Uh, uh, the thing to note was this 60% was actually uh, an average. Uh, so there were certain equipments which were only used three to four hours a day specifically certain lab equipments or some others, which were kept running throughout the day and were consuming power. We also found out things like coffee machines and, and vending machines were actually used in for a eight to 10 hour period. And again, those could have been very well switched off for almost 10 to 12 hour period. So those actions that we took as an outcome of that, we got an average savings of 60% uh, from the original baseline where we left them running as is. And it was a real beautiful outcome that we got. Uh, the, the two additional interesting pieces that the team, uh, that the team found out was uh, not only were we being able to drive energy savings as an outcome of this, there were two scenarios which they found out. One was one of the lab equipments was drawing a significant amount of power, much, much, much more than it was needed to be. And we realized it was a faulty equipment. You, we have the ability to configure based on the equipment category, uh, the recommended power consumption levels, and you could trigger alarms and alerts based on anomalous power draw by a particular equipment. So we, we were able to implement that and that was really beneficial both in terms of for that, that one, a faulty lab equipment was identified which could have given error, erroneous results uh, to any experiment that was conducted into the lab. And then secondly, there was a possibility of a fire hazard going forward if that faulty equipment was kept on connected and was drawing power. So overall, a really interesting scenario. Uh, that we saw. We are in fact executing a lot of pilots uh, in UK having launched their uh, almost middle of this year and we are kind of in the stage where we are now completing these pilots and now going for a full rollout. So Cranfield at the moment is at a stage where they are doing a full-fledged rollout across their campus. 
The first 90 was just a pilot that we did in order to show value to the team. And, and that's the interesting piece of it. Uh, and, and in fact, one of the things we would expect even from the participants of this is if you see a good opportunity in either your campus or with your customers that you are working with and somebody who would like to see uh, their 25%, how it is utilized and drive sustainability and energy savings in their own buildings and portfolio. Uh, I think we are at that interesting stage where the offering is about to get launched, but we are 100% ready for similar pilots like the Greenfield one for your facility. Uh, let me go ahead and move ahead. And, and this is an interesting piece, which as we are launching in, in US that we need to be aware about. This is about the, 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 the whole compliance scenario. Uh, if um, either of you or, or the people who have joined, you must have heard of the Title 24 requirements, uh, primarily prevalent in states like California and Arizona, which are calling out uh, for presence of smart and controlled uh, sockets as part of any commercial building rollout on you. Uh, so what I want to put ahead is, what are the key requirements of such kind of Title 24 or compliance requirements? One is the scheduling. So Title 24 in California calls for 50% of the sockets that are controlled and managed and have the capability of scheduling. So either uh, an automated shutoff capability. Uh, it also calls for an occupancy sensor interlock. Uh, primarily the hotels are looking for that, that things are made on only when there is an auto occupancy uh, detected. It could be occupancy via a hotel management system as the room is booked in a hotel system or a guest has act, a guest key card has been activated or it could be even combining a small occupancy sensor to, in order to achieve these kind of outcomes. Uh, uh, the ability of manual override switches. So you know, we, we talked about that. Yes, even though that can be auto scheduled, but there is an ability for a manual override, which is uh, that would require. And then holiday function and uh, is another capability that would need to be provided. Uh, the One of the most interesting pieces is demand response control. We call it automatic demand response, uh, which is basically that you need to switch off uh, non-essential plug loads based on high utility tariff scenario. So this is a very interesting uh, use case where this Title 24 is also calling out, apart from the ability to control, manage, schedule sockets, either automatically time-based or linked with occupancy and have manual overrides, which is an holiday function. Uh, this is one of the most interesting requirements that is shaping up is the ability to not only control, but directly switch off uh, controlled or uh, plug connected sockets which are connected to non-essential loads based on open ADR 2.0 signals which basically means that in, in, in times of high tariff scenario or high demand scenario where the grid does not have enough capacity to satisfy the downstream demand you need to have the ability automatically to switch off non-essential loads. Uh, uh, so that's another very, very interesting requirement. California has already implemented that. We, we will see uh, a lot more states kind of going down this path. I think New York is already shaping up a similar, very, very similar regulatory um, kind of uh, structure for their buildings and their building owners and facility managers. We see similar in ASHRAE 9.1 and ICC 2021. Uh, the the solution, the connected power solution that we are launching is going to comply all of the capabilities, right from scheduling to have an occupancy sensor interlock, to have um, a manual override switch, uh, which is again configurable, and then having holiday function and including the most important capability of automated demand response, all inclusive will be part of the Honeywell solution. Uh, so you can, so I think to all participants, uh, I want to kind of call out that, that whenever you see this, that you need to provide a Title 24 compliant solution of plug load management 
and you want to do it with one single BMS system that is managing your HVAC, that is managing your lights, uh, you can meet that same compliance without investing into a separate system uh, with the Honeywell solution that we are bringing to market. Mm. So this is my last slide and, and we can slowly transition into the Q&A post this slide, but I want to spend a little bit of time as on, on, on this particular slide as where, where we have. Uh, the interesting piece is how we are going to architect uh, the whole offering. So we have the example of, uh, the as you can see, you, we, we have the, the, uh, the smart outlets on down below. They form a wireless mesh network to talk among themselves. Uh, they, they finally converge into a hub. Now, if you remember, I had mentioned that today the hub can ha have a capacity of up to 50 such outlets uh, that, that, is, that is, it can support. Uh, the interesting piece to note here is the communication between the hub and the outlets is a wireless mesh RF mesh technology. It is not a Wi-Fi based technology. This is not a, a smart home solution. Commercial buildings uh, need the scalability. Uh, commercial buildings do not have the flexibility to allow any devices to come on to a Wi-Fi based system. Think of, of how critical the Wi-Fi uh, architecture needs to happen if it has to support hundreds and thousands of outlets in order to move that. So there is no need of a Wi-Fi system. This, they, this is a, a closed uh, Wi-Fi, uh, this is a RF mesh technology. So the outlets talk among themselves and then they can talk into the hub. So the hub also need not to be in the range of each and every socket, as long as the outlets are within 10 to 15 feet of each other and they can talk among themselves to reach the data up to the hub. So that's the interesting technology that we have utilized in order to provide that scalability and the resiliency of a commercial solution that it needs. Once the data reaches into the hub, that's where we uh, it basically converts itself to backnet over IP. And using the Ethernet network, it reaches into a supervisor. Uh, when I say supervisor, these these are the Niagara supervisors that you have. Uh, it, the, so the various Niagara-based supervisors that we have part of our Honeywell portfolio. Uh, we have uh, EBI offerings and everything. The interesting thing to note here is uh, that since the hub converts the data onto BACnet over IP, even it might be a scenario where it need not to be a Honeywell supervisor or a Niagara supervisor because this is an open technology. Anybody could use any standard supervisor to catch the data over BACnet over IP and then start managing the, the hubs and the sockets and have that same level of control and capability that I talked about. The only advantage of using a Honeywell uh, BMS or a supervisor here would be the availability of a pre-built, a pre-built set of dashboards and an easy onboarding wizard, the combination of which allows us to commission, let's say a 5,000 socket system within a day. As long as you have been able to retrofit each of the sockets and onboard each of the sockets with a mobile app, the whole commissioning of such a system could be accomplished very quickly and singly in a, in a day. Uh, so this is about the architecture uh, that we talked about on premises that is available. What we are also doing in parallel is a very interesting piece is now, not only are these sockets can be controlled, managed, supervised, scheduled from an on-premises BAMS supervisor, but in parallel, we will be supporting an architecture which will allow these sockets the hubs and all of it to be managed from the cloud. So the base architecture remains the same, the same outlets talking to the same hub and a collection of hubs being, being talking to each other, but rather than being communicating to an on-premises BMS supervisor, 
the same offering now communicates with the help of a BEMS gateway goes to a supervisor on cloud. We, we will call this connected power on cloud. Uh, exactly similar levels of capabilities that are needed could be achieved and provided here. So think of the same scheduling, the same reporting, the same availability of granularity in data, uh, the same level of uh, controls that you need to push back, the same kind of scheduling that you need to do back. Whatever was available through an on-premises supervisor, the same thing will be available through on-cloud supervisor. Okay. Uh, the, the only difference between the two models where it is on-premises versus cloud is one. The first one is based on a CAPEX investment. The second one is based either on a combination of a CAPEX investment for the sockets and the hub, whereas the whole BEMS becomes a subscription. Or we could even think of an end-to-end subscription model that we wanted to bring to our customers for the option number two. So re-clarifying, on the left-hand side, you have an architecture that allows our sockets to be connected and managed from an on-premises BEMS supervisor, primarily suited for retrofit models and new builds that are looking to for a one-time investment on a CAPEX model. The right hand side is best suited for a retrofitable model tied to the outcomes of sustainability and energy savings and customers who are willing to rather than invest on a one time effort, but into a subscription, a commit to a subscription model tied to the amount of savings uh, that we are being able to generate. So kind of different, different ways to address the same outcomes for the customers depending on their need and their preference going about and going ahead. Okay, so with that, I am more or less towards the end of our presentation and, and coverage. We I think we will end up having a good amount of 20 minutes uh, towards dedicating towards uh, Q&A uh, and, and the session that we have. The, the one thing that I would like to pre-point out that at the end of the Q&A session, towards the end, we will release a small poll in order to capture your, uh, your feedback from the session, as well as any need for deep diving with you and your team as you look to take this solution to yourself, to your own premises or to your customers, as well as, as I mentioned, something in the very beginning is, uh, we are in a phase where we are about to launch this into the North America market. And you saw the crane field example as how they selected uh, a certain specific sockets that they wanted to convert into smart sockets and see and ran through that four to eight week of, uh, of a proof of value period. We would love to do that uh, with you and whoever is interested. So there will be a dedicated poll question as where you want us, our team to get engaged further in order to facilitate a proof of value with you and your team. Uh, so with that, I now open it up for questions. I think Karen will be supporting me with the questions and taking it further. Thanks, Sid. Um, I, I, I wanted to, uh, to broaden the focus a little bit um, on, the, on the topic. And I, and I guess my first question is, uh, you did talk about a few things like you know, coffee machines, vending machines, that kind of thing, and then some specialized situations, you know, refrigerators and labs and that sort of thing. What do you think is, um, I think more, most typically, you know, for a, a building that say doesn't have a kitchen or doesn't have this specialized equipment, what do you think the low, low hanging fruit is for, um, for, the, for this kind of technology? What, what's the kind of uh, technology that we all have sitting in our offices or in our buildings that doesn't really need to be running 247? Absolutely. So, so, so we have to look, Karen, at the market in two ways. One, in a situation where it is compliance driven. So think of states like California and others who are mandating that going forward, you need to have to control 50% of your sockets need to get control. So a lot of the demand would come from the fact that this is a mandate and a compliance driven requirement. 
On the other hand, if I look into a very traditional commercial office, primarily we have to look for opportunities where there are continuously connected loads. So in an office, think of the projector machines, think of the TVs that are for display, think of the printers that are connected and running at post office hours. Uh, and, and that's where we saw the biggest kind of savings. Uh, however, in your record, uh, not the company. yes, however, what we saw that these kind of savings are getting multiplied in, in a healthcare scenario, in a hospital. Mm. We saw one of our best returns in our NHS hospital in UK, yeah. where there are hundreds of plug connected devices, including patient TVs in patient rooms, which are kept running even after hours after the patient has vacated the particular cabin or something. Uh, so, so, so we we saw. So, uh, it becomes significantly more interesting for verticals like as higher education or universities, healthcare, and hospitality. But commercial offices too, like the examples that I gave, have really shown, and specifically on those kind of plugs. So, so in summary, not all plugs need to be converted into a smart plug. At, the best outcomes we generally see when we convert 30 to 50 percent of our plugs to smart and connected, we see the best return of investment through the savings that we are being able to generate. So it's it's all those uh, all those items sitting on standby, you know. <laughs> um, and then I I did understand that you had a, you know, you did have a little struggle or not a struggle, but it was a lot of work. Um, Excuse me. Um, so uh, it was a lot of work, uh, to, you know, developing plugs for the U.S. market. You're already in the British market, and so, you know, just just like, uh, just a very high level. You know, what what were the big differences between the, the British and the, the North American market in terms of how you had to reconfigure the the hardware? Yes, and and that is a very interesting story. So as I mentioned, um, Honeywell had acquired MK Electric. Uh, somewhere in 2005. So these these plugs actually come from MK Electric. MK Electric is a household name in, in the UK market, in the Middle East market, Southeast Asia, India, and others. Uh, they are 100 years, as old as Honeywell, in fact. As old as Honeywell, a leader of a name in the, in the wiring devices market. They were never in North America. So MK was never in North America. So my natural, so you can understand why why Honeywell being an American company had to launch it in UK first, because that's where MK is headquartered. So we had a natural pre-developed regular plug available in the UK market, which we first converted into a smart and, and connected to our BMS system and launched it into the market. But then comes what is the natural, most natural next market to go and hence North America. So we, so we went through a full development of creating a socket that is now for the North America market. If I say the key differences, obviously that is based on the British standard. This is a UL approved product. So we went through a full UL approval uh, in order to get the product out. Uh, that is based on a two, 230 volt system. This is a 110 plug system. Uh, the British plugs are horizontal. This is vertically mounted. Uh, so there are significant amount of differences even even if visually, if I had to, if I had the picture of that, visually it's different. It looks different. The receptacle is different because you even the the sizing of the of the plug that that where it fits into the socket, it's different than the U.S. one and the British one. So there are significant differences, but the but the major ones are the two thirty to one ten and the need of a, a UL approval versus a, a BS approval. Well, we do. That does segue nicely into a couple of questions. We do have uh, someone asking if this is available in the Middle Eastern market. And then also, um, so I think someone was asking uh, if this is available in, in Europe yet, or is it just the UK and then North America? No. So uh, one, this is available in the UK market. Uh, now, there are a lot of countries which use the, the British standard. Uh, with so in Middle East, this is available. We 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 have we have already customers who are using this. Uh, so Saudi Arabia, uh, UAE, Qatar are all the places where the offering is available. This will all we are also have kicked off our pilots in Malaysia, Singapore. These are also again the places where 
the British standard offering is uh, is applicable. Uh, the North America launch, just to kind of for for all the participants that have been here, uh, we are kicking off a soft launch, or we call it an early adopter launch, uh, in the month of January. That means this will be a limited limited release in the January, with a full fledged commercial release available all uh, at all places in early April. So that's what our timeline is at the moment for the North America market. For the rest, it is, as I mentioned, it's already available in these other markets. Okay. Um, so I, we do have a question here. Uh, are the current BMS and BAS solutions in the market only able to manage the HVAC and lighting loads and not the plug loads? So you've already mentioned when this will be available in the US market, but what about the existing, you know, your existing systems other existing systems do they handle plugs? Yes. So, so typically, if you if you think, and I, I want to give a very uh, a very candid and a straightforward answer to this question, uh, ninety nine percent of the buildings all over the world do not have a smart socket installed. None of the commercial. This has penetrated in the residential segment, primarily starting off with smart plugs, but transitioning then to smart socket requires an additional level of approval and technology. You have to go through a stringent UL approval and all of the factors do come in. But again, remember that this is a remarkably underpenetrated uh, segment where none of the buildings have it in the world. Second, do we have, do, do all traditional BMS systems have this capability? No, we don't. Even Honeywell systems did not have. Six months back, None of our BMS supervisors had the capability to integrate or manage plug loads. We did not have neither uh, any of our Niagara-based systems or even the non-Niagara-based Honeywell's BMS supervisors had this capability. And, and to expand that scenario, neither the if, even if you pick up any of the top competitor systems, neither they had that capability. So with because you you not only had to have that capability on the BME EMS side. But you also had an appropriate hardware, which could be controlled. So it was a combination of these two factors that needed to come in place in order to give you one comprehensive solution of plug load management. But remember to the team that I want to stress once more that this is a 25% energy optimizations opportunity. It's a significant opportunity. It's, it is the next biggest chunk of optimization in after HVAC. I know people go after cooling and all of the, all the optimization that can happen. This is the next biggest chunk of optimization scenario that is available in the building. And that's the space and the opportunity that is opening up with this particular capability. Okay, well, we do have a, a number of items in the, in the queue here. Um, someone asked a when setting up the system, is it possible to map plugs in different hubs into one logical group? Absolutely, absolutely. So again, think of it, this whole solution has been designed keeping in mind a commercial uh, system. Uh, and I want to take this question to a two level into one. One, you have a large facility, 100% across different hubs and everything. Once you have onboarded all of the sockets, it doesn't matter a particular socket was onboarded to which hub. You have the ability to group them. You have to the ability to group them together and manage it. The, the second level of the interesting piece comes in when I showed you the cloud architecture. Is not only are you, if it is on-prem within one campus, the story ends, as I mentioned. Now think of the scenario where you have multiple sites, and this is where it is becoming interesting for a lot of customers that are coming up today that we are seeing is across different sites now you are being able to connect and you can now group in them across multiple sites even. Uh, uh, one of the interesting use cases that came for a very, very large retail giant, um, I'm not able to take their name because we don't have the authority to take their name where they're implementing this, is across all the retail stores across UK, they're implementing this and what they are doing is they're creating a group called as freezers. Uh, across 160 sites that they have, and they're implementing one schedule across their freezers based on their store closing timeline. So, so not only the grouping can be extended across multiple hubs, 
the grouping can be extended across multiple uh, sites also in case it's a multi-site scalable cloud solution. Okay. Um, ooh, here's a good one. Uh, doesn't this introduce a new level of resource manager management? He calls it the plug monitor police. Um, what business culture and changes were noted? You know, what's, what, what needs to change at the, in the culture uh, during evaluation and launch? Absolutely. So we, we, we did think about it, and this was an interesting um, piece that came up. And, and one, I will answer a very straightforward question to this, to this question is, one, no, because I think uh, you, you are using the same BMS interface. So nothing is changing. I'm, I'm not asking you to invest into a new resource, a new BMS. Most of the buildings today have already a BMS system. Uh, in fact, if, if I can go ahead and boldly say that 50% of the world's building are almost managed by either a Honeywell or a Niagara-based uh, BEMS system. So think of all of those buildings. I'm just extending what you already have. Plug load management becomes one additional screen in the set of screens that uh, the BEMS system already has. So you are not investing in any new architecture and a new software or a new platform. I'm just adding one more capability into what you already have. So the, your regular BEMS operator who was now managing everything for you now continues to have one more job added to his list of days that he now gets to schedule and manage the plug loads. So that's a very straightforward answer to that question. The interesting answer, the, the other side of the flip side I want to mention is what we saw a lot of customers come up with it were non-BEMS customers customers who are looking to drive sustainability savings, but where their only place of savings ended up becoming plug loads. So think of uh, a tier two or tier three hospitality scenario, uh, a, a small hotel, which does not have a fully functional BMS system, but most of their loads within a particular building are connected to plug loads. And if they have to implement uh, uh, a sustainability, let's say a lot of in, in European countries, we are seeing a lot of these organizations are adopting sustainability goals and to drive and reach energy savings across their portfolio. Uh, plug load management or plug load saving becomes their only true means of achieving those kind of goals within their facilities. And, and they are investing in kind of a plug load management solution, including the lightweight cloud BEMS solution that I talked about. As as uh, as because that's the scenario where a lot of we are seeing a lot of traction, where we are creating a subscription model for these kind of uh, organizations who do not have a significant amount of capex to invest, but want to have a lightweight model tied to the savings that could they could generate. Which which leads me to this question, which I think is. Uh a logical extension because there's always somebody who comes in and works out of hours and they don't understand why their printer doesn't work that their printers on a schedule right um is there a local override 100 percent. each each of these plugs come with a local override and you can configure different scenarios of overrides in into it uh we in the, in the simplest and the most basic override scenario is the, each of the sockets have a switch uh let's say within whenever what, what we configured for one of our customers is whenever let's say out of hours somebody comes in to print something a printer in, in a let's say after 8 p.m the office is closed he has an urgency he comes in the manual override could be configured by the operator in a way that whenever somebody presses that manual override switch on the socket it gets activated for 30 minutes and after that it switches off again up to full control Somebody could switch it, okay, once it has switched off, it remains switched on till the time the next cycle begins. So all of these are configurable. Somebody wanted specifically that, no, you cannot switch it off. So he disabled the manual switch it off. And this was done by one of our customers who was managing a resort where he did not want arcade machines uh, to be switched on after 8 p.m. That was the shutdown, then it's done. It cannot be switched on before next day, 6 a.m. So all of these are configurable options. Uh, and and that that's possible. And even like you could even include an occupancy interlock that the manual override is switched off unless occupancy is detected. So think of uh, if if there is a conference room, 
and we could have an occupancy interlock that only the manual override is activated as long as occupancy is available. So all of those scenarios can be played out. Think of all the different kind of workflows that you can pair up within the BMS system and you could configure and get that done. Cool. So uh, any plans to adapt this technology for the residential market? Uh, one, uh, not at the moment, to be very fair, because primarily what we are trying to differentiate ourselves is how this technology is different from the residential market. The residential market, if you primarily see, is at a very lower price point. It, it's primarily based on a Wi-Fi based technology is dependent on the Wi-Fi being present. And then it's not scalable. It's not scalable. The system has been designed for scalability. It's a remarkably robust system. You can think of 5,000 sockets talking to each other, creating a wireless RF mesh network, scalable, gets connected to a BMS system, gets managed holistically through one, one platform and dashboard. So that's, that's there is. So the solution is aimed at a very different segment, created at a very different level of robustness uh, that is needed. Uh, do we see that as an option in future? Yes, we do see the as, as, as we see the demand kind of bring you up. Will the residential segment accept a robust solution like this? There, there might be. So there might be a slice of market that where it could go in. If not the homes, but at least we would target the multi-site, uh, the multifamily apartment buildings and everything could be a right target for this. Cool. Um... Too bad, though, that I don't get it for my house. Yeah. Um, so there, there are, uh, I think we've got time for two more questions. And then I just want to let you all know that some of you have asked very specific questions about related to costs in certain scenarios. And I, I, I think the best way to handle that is by, um, you know, when the poll gets deployed after the Q&A, that then you can indicate interest and, and the folks um, working with Siddhartha can the SID can reach out yeah. to you. And, and I could respond to that. As I mentioned, we have not yet launched it into the North America market. Uh, so the, as I mentioned, there will be a limited release. We will be working with select few partners and, right. and select few end customers during this first, because this is a completely new technology. And yeah. we also wanted to have a limited release so that people get to experience it, see the outcomes. Uh, you will see a lot many more case studies over the next few months of the similar ones that I I could show you one today. There are more in UK. We want to replicate that in US and, and have that. And then a full-fledged commercial release in somewhere uh, in April, beginning of April. That's when you will see a full-fledged pricing list, a published pricing list and everything being available at the hands of our distributors and contractors. Okay. Well, I want to get to these last two questions that I think are useful just really quick if we can. One is, what is the failure mode um, mm -hmm. on? If if a if a socket fails, does it is an is yes. the socket just powered? It's on. Yes. So okay. so if the network and the connectivity fails, or even if I remove the whole complete connectivity, it start behaving as a dumb socket. It just performs okay. as a regular socket. So no question on that. And then if network or connectivity fails, you get notified at the central level. Great. Okay. Last question. I know there were other questions, apologies, but I know some of you, you're really going to need to speak directly to, to our sponsor. What, if any, cybersecurity concerns are there for this technology? Absolutely. So this, so this is, some, I am happy that somebody did raise this. Uh, we, we are certified both in our cloud infrastructure as well as in the hub that we have designed. The, the cybersecurity standards are almost to the level of financial transaction grade. So AES-256 encryption, when the sockets communicate to each other, uh, to TLS 1.2, when the hub is communicating over BACnet to the supervisor. So we, we can go deeper, but in simple words, the, the, the highest levels of encryption that are available in the market have been used. And that's where it, I, I keep on stressing, this is a commercial grade, scalable solution meant for the highest kind of enterprise customers. Uh, no effort has been spared in making it robust and cyber secure. Well, that's it for today. We, you did get a lot of questions them, you know, not a few of them are kind of tough. So, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Sid. Thanks for being with us today. And thanks again to our sponsor, Honeywell. Uh, our next webinar is on January 9th, and it's a webinar on 
uh, updates to the Energy Star um, program. So thanks again, Sid. Thank you. And that's our webinar for today.